everyone. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Creative Truth. Today, I have a, a dear friend of mine, a guest. Uh, his name is Andrew Baker, and he is a visual artist in the San Francisco Bay Area. So, Andy, would you like to first uh, tell me who you are and what you do? Uh, sure. My name is Andrew Baker. I'm a visual effects artist uh, currently in the Bay Area, as Tyler mentioned. I do primarily compositing uh, for visual effects, but I'm kind of a generalist, so I can do 3D work and all the fun stuff and the nitty gritty details of uh, going deep into the video space. The video sphere. So, yeah. so like, uh, comp what's, what's compositing? Like, what is, what is entailed with compositing? Uh, compositing is... Uh, sort of the last stop in the VFX pipeline where all the other artists hand in their work to the compositor to um, layer over the live action plates or whatever and form a final composition that will be handed down to edit in the NLE pipeline. Cool. So is this something that like you... I mean, I obviously know a lot of these answers, but when you were like 17, 18, did you know this is the career path you wanted to go down? No, definitely not. I what, would did you, say. What, what did you see yourself doing? I knew around that age, 17, 18, like when, when we were applying for colleges and stuff, um, I knew I wanted to do something sort of with either graphic design or with like television production or video production, but where those sort of intersected for me wasn't very clear at that time. Um, it was a little later on that I kind of discovered visual effects. Yeah, it's funny because you studied art and, uh, and I studied television and then you went to work at a TV station and I went to be like a multimedia artist. So we kind of yeah. like to the <laughs> cross path a little bit. Um, so you went, so what did you study in undergrad and then you ended up going back to school? Yes, in undergrad, I studied, I was a dual major, and I studied, uh, it was computer art, which was mostly graphic design, but there were other things, like, there were other classes included in that, um, made basically graphic design from what I remember, and um, film production or television production. I think was the actual uh, track that I took and they coincided pretty well and out of undergrad is when I got that TV station job which was even kind of further down the production hole than I think I was necessarily prepared to go. <laughs> MCO right? It, I did a lot of master control operation and broadcast technician type work. Yeah. So it was a little less creative than kind of what I foresaw myself doing for a while. So then you decided to go back to school or how long did you do that for? And then how did you decide to go back to school? Yeah. So I worked uh, at the news station for about three years. Um, and that was kind of a weird phase for me in that it was sort of, I ended up in this career path. And then after the fact was when I was like, wow, I'm not super happy with what I'm doing necessarily. And I don't know where this is going. And I had to reflect back on a lot of, like the principal stuff that you're supposed to reflect back on at a younger age for a lot of people. But I was uh, 25 or so before I decided uh, VFX sounds exactly like what I want to do. Um, and so, yeah, I took that plunge to basically drive across the country to go back to school. And uh, school's not always something that is recommended for VFX artists. I don't know. I was happy with my education, um, and I don't know if I would have been able to accelerate as quickly in that career change if I didn't go back to school. I'm not sure. Um, How did most people get into it? Well, a lot of people, I mean, it's totally possible to get into it just through working um, and coming up with a, a good portfolio that you can show. Um, 
So just getting down to the grind, I guess. Um, for me, that didn't seem quite as clear of a path because it would have been hard to, you know, come up with this portfolio while also learning and working full time or over full time at the the news station. I don't know. Everyone kind of needs to weigh that option for themselves, I think. But mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I decided to go back to school and go across the country and drag my girlfriend across the country with me, and it's been great. One good thing that came out of the TV station, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, let's see. So now tell me how you make the majority of your livable income um what do your what does your client base look like are you having to sell are you getting referrals are i know my uh, some other prior guests have uh full-time salary jobs in creative fields but how do you basically survive yeah so it's pretty much uh a dance between all of those things um right now i have a nice gig going on where it's basically full-time salary and it's been a pretty great change of pace like w2 um, w2 salary yeah oh wow okay cool um well i think it's technically hourly but it's kind of like a contract salary per week type thing i don't know um i'm sorry i forgot the question <laughs> so basically how do you make your money like how does your client base oh yeah so it's kind of tricky getting started. I'd say you kind of have to feel around the freelance client market in your area is usually, I would say the easiest way. Um, and just getting how to network as much as possible for someone like me who's kind of introverted. That's a little harder, but um, once you kind of have worked with a few people, they, will return to you for more work in the future. So you get returned income. And it's kind of just about keeping that ball rolling because once it's rolling, it just picks up momentum and you get more and more work. And then there almost becomes like a threshold where you're getting too much work and you have to start saying no to stuff. So <laughs> that's great. I mean, good problem to have, right? Yeah. Um, I remember one time you said to me, you were like, how do you sell? And I was like, I don't know. I don't selling stuff like I'm just people come to me and they're like oh I need a video or I need a website or I need whatever and like I'm just like yeah I could do that for you and then I just yeah. so like how do you sell <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I do sell very well um I've managed somehow I guess I'm not very salesy in my techniques I don't think but um I guess I've just made up for it with like hunting down people I can be pretty um what's the word I'm looking for I guess I can kind of be persistent enough to get some of the leads that I get versus salesy <laughs> so if you just keep following up with people enough or um you have some sort of mutual connection you can hit on and then you just check in I have mentors and stuff who I've never even met in person um, back in New York when I was deciding whether to go to school or not. I reached out to people on LinkedIn, probably like a hundred different people and just started talking to them and asked them about, you know, schools, about the industry, things like that. And a couple of the people I would sit down and have Skype chats with or phone calls with and maintained those relationships over the years. I still Skype people, um, the same mentors, and they still give me great advice going forward. So yeah, I would say just um, definitely find where your, your niche kind of hangs out. I know a lot of VFX people hang out on LinkedIn, especially the recruiters. So that's where I did a lot of my persistent hunting for leads. And aside from that, let me think, uh, have yourself a nice clean website so you can capture those leads. Um, and word of mouth, nothing beats that of course. So are your clients are like, are your clients in the Bay area? 
Yeah, most of them are in the Bay Area. Sometimes, excuse me, uh, LA, not too far of a drive down there. Um, and with COVID, like you're not meeting with them in person though. No, um, I almost did a job recently that would have been on set and that would have been kind of interesting to see how that functioned during COVID, but it, it didn't go through with me. Um, so yeah, I've just been working remotely and it's been, um, without coming off as like, I know it's a very difficult time, but for me personally, it's been like kind of nice. <laughs> it's, it's kind of weird. Cause like you can technically do what you do from anywhere in the world because you're remote, but Right. Being in the Bay Area does like kind of have that like established feel to it still where you're right. like, yeah, I'm right here. <laughs> so like, can people do this from the middle of the country or do they have to move out to L.A. or like the West Coast? Right. To, like, to get yeah, started? that's a, that's kind of a good question. Um, I don't know if I know the answer because I think that there is definitely something about the like magnetism of being like in one of those cities that has all those creative jobs um there's just so many people that are in a similar field to you that can't be like downplayed how well that can help you but you definitely can do vfx from anywhere for sure whether it's youtube or uh even you can probably get uh tv gigs I know a lot of the bigger productions are still kind of coming around on remote work because there's a lot of security concerns for like IPs and leaks and stuff like that. But definitely you can do VFX from anywhere for sure. Yeah. So do you focus in um, like commercial stuff or entertainment or like, do you have a niche as far as like the kind of VFX or compositing that you're doing? Um, not as much as you might think. I've kind of done a lot of different stuff, actually. Right now I'm working on stop motion projects, which are really fun to work on and give me like a whole new appreciation for the details that go into that work. Um, brushing, that work. brushing out rigs, is that what you call yeah. it? Yeah. yeah. I only know, yeah. I only, still only know rotoscoping, so that's. <laughs> I mean, that is, one of the basic principles that is used in almost every shot really. So, mm -hmm. um, and I forgot again, what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, oh boy, it doesn't even matter. Uh, so, so, um, what I wanted to ask next was, uh, if we look at, if you look back on your career, like were there moments where you met the right person or, something happened to you and so you made a choice and that led you down a path and like at the mo at the time you didn't know it was going to be significant but now that you look back on your career you're like oh wow this moment in time was like really significant in the advancement of my career yeah those times can be a little difficult to pinpoint exactly but there's definitely shifts that happen and um from my experience, usually for the positive. So I almost kind of look out. It's It almost seems like it happens in waves of like every few years or so. There's some like pivotal shift, whether it's mm. in like my home life or my career life or something or a relocation. And they seem to always like uh, build momentum towards my goals. Um, so I'm trying to think of a particular moment. I mean, just again, like deciding to go back to school and move, relocate. How did you have time to leave your old job at the TV station? It was a, it wasn't a just like spontaneous decision, really. It was, it was pretty thought out. I was researching schools for like six months or so. Um, and really diving into what I wanted to do. 
Because what happened was I was quite certain that that was not what I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure what I did want to do. <laughs> so it, it was kind of like a working backwards from a goal type of thing where I was, I would literally just like dive into Indeed job postings. And at the time to start, I was applying a lot of places. And then I noticed that I was applying certain places and for certain jobs. And in the back of my mind, I realized, yeah, that's, that makes sense. Cause that's kind of what I want to do. And I would just kind of go back, trace it back to, it would always trace back to like some sort of VFX in my case. Um, and so that was like when I discovered visual effects because like our, we went to high school together and our high school didn't have visual effects. We had like Photoshop or Premiere and even my undergrad didn't cover visual effects really. Um, so I didn't know about it. <laughs> I mean, I knew it existed, but I didn't know that, that world. And so Tracy sort of just like, going through all the indie jobs and deciding, okay, that job looks amazing. That's what I want to do. What skills do I need to know to do that? Uh, what, what are the companies that have those jobs? Um, what are the recruiters names on LinkedIn? I would like stop people on LinkedIn, send them a message. Hey, uh, my name is Andrew. I'm looking into getting into VFX. Uh, do you have any suggestions for, uh, someone like me, <laughs> not always met with like super detailed responses or responses at all, but occasionally you'll, you'll make some really great connections just asking those types of questions. And it just became apparent to me over time that like visual effects was what I wanted to do. Um, and yeah, I, it's weird because I had no idea. <laughs> it just felt like uh, in my younger life, a lot of times it felt like I was really interested in the arts, but I didn't know what my medium was. Mm -hmm. So I just constantly felt like I was not, I was lacking like my medium of how to express my creativity almost. And you knew, you kind of had a sense of what you didn't want to do at least. Yeah, that's always been very easy for me is not knowing or knowing what I don't want to do. Uh, <laughs> well, it's like a big process of elimination because there's like so many things you can do in this space. Yeah, totally. And even visual effects has a ton of different fields. Um, so if you're interested in it, you should definitely look into it. And there's hundreds of different careers just in the visual effects industry so are there any like youtube channels or websites you recommend for people to like check out to learn more and get their feet wet get started um usually like tutorials um i watch some tutorials that are i guess more well known would be like cg geek or uh blender guru uh, Alan McKay does tutorials, the Corridor Crew do some interesting videos. I think they're going to do some tutorials eventually. Um, yeah, and there's every there's so much stuff on YouTube. There's so many different tutorials um, that you can look at. Um, figuring out what to look for when you don't know is is probably the main problem so um yeah follow some channels that you're interested in and they'll introduce you to those kind of topics so what you mentioned blender uh i think you said blender guru um what software are you using mostly and then like what is some stuff that you kind of wish you knew but you don't know yet uh i use nuke mostly uh foundry tools um, but I do use Blender. I use After Effects. Um, those are definitely my main like heavy hitters, but there are other tracking applications and stuff like that that I can use or color grading. Um, but definitely Nuke is like my primarily what's open and what I'm diving into. A lot of uh, compositors do use After Effects because it's significantly cheaper and more like widely spread. Um, it's just about your, like what you need to use. 
like what tools you need access to. Um, and what I would like to know is, um, well, I would like to just, I suppose, improve my like modeling and animation and lighting type, <laughs> uh, those areas, because it's, it's just, a, it's a lot of um, very technical, um, getting the levels all right, matching their environment and stuff like that. It's, you can practice it for a lifetime, I feel like. It is part of like one of the advantages of being on set I've heard from, cause I watch Corridor Crew too. Um, like when you're on set, you can, I guess like capture 3D models of how the light hits an object and how it reflects and. Yeah, so if you're on set, um, a lot of times they'll grab like an HDRI, which is just like a 360 photo basically that they use to map the, the lighting levels. Um, so in like Blender or 3ds Max or Maya, those are the three most popular 3D applications, I think. Um, you'll just, when you have your 3D geometry in, you'll basically tell it to look at the HDRI image that you took on set and use that for like the reflections and things like that. And it, it makes it look way more real and integrated it into the scene if you do get those HDRIs, like from the actual uh, scene that you shot at. Yeah, because a, a lot of directors, like from what I understand, don't understand the post process or VFX. So they're just like, here you go, figure out how to make this look good. And you're like, ah, I would have made so many decisions differently if I was there because like it, this is, yeah. Know, I think that's kind of the bane of a VFX artist's life and probably a lot of creative fields is a lot of the time the people that you're working for don't really know what you do and they're just going to hand you something and tell you to make it work and that's just that. <laughs> and, and as a compositor that's literally your job is to take other people's stuff and like make it fit together right? Yeah yeah and there's always going to be something unforeseen or like something that it's like, Oh my God, why didn't you just shoot that on a green screen? You would have saved me like a thousand hours, but that's just the job. <laughs> sure. So that, that's a, that's a great point actually. Like, because, because this is like every freelancer, every contract employee like has a difficult time quoting and estimating, but you're, what you do is so complex. Like how do you go about, quoting a job so that you're not going to end up like like i thought this was going to take me 10 hours but here we are like 40 hours into it and then like you have to go back to the client and be like well actually i'm going to need to bill you more or, like how do you approach that yeah that's that's definitely a, a whole nother monster um and i've it's something that i'm interested in learning from others as well my my practice has been like really kind of strictly sitting down and going through everything and marking off how long it will take me, best estimate, and then basically adding like 20% padding and then like 30% for taxes and just going through and hitting everything and making sure that it's as accurate as possible but it takes a lot of time to go through all of that sometimes. Sometimes they'll hand you just like a hard drive full of files and ask you how long it, or like how much it costs. And it's like, I don't know, what do you need? <laughs> and they don't know what to tell you. They don't know what to ask for sometimes. So you need to practice like predicting those types of things. And it's an ongoing process. Yeah, managing expectations and like almost like training your client because um you have to say well i think i could do it in in this amount of time but really i i don't know or when they say i i, I need more pizzazz can you add more it needs more oomph and you're like yeah. <laughs> let me just turn the oomph slider up <laughs> you know like what that, what does that mean you know sure yeah so yeah it's a, i think like there's probably no good answer but um yeah, I appreciate your insight because it's it's like a it's a I think like mark because you're marking it up twenty percent, but at the end of the day, like it's always gonna 
it always ends up being more yeah for sure yeah. Yeah. there are times when i'm like should i just like triple this just like right off the bat <laughs> because it's like it doesn't it adds up on paper but in practice not so much sometimes can you tell me a story like like when has that happened um it happens so okay I mean, sometimes it happens the other way too. And it, you actually get through the shots a lot quicker than you thought. But a good example of one is I was doing a test shot of the comp, um, of the first shot, just to make sure this is what all the rest of them are gonna be, you know, aligned with. This is what we're gonna go off of. And I, ha on paper, had, the shot taking me like four or five hours and it took me 20 hours. <laughs> so so like, I was way behind on that one. Five times what you thought. Yeah. Yeah. So what were like, what, I mean, again, it may be too complicated, but what really ended up taking? It's yeah. It, there's always going to be some sort of in my work and comping there's, you got to keep your eye out for, like pops and things that will catch the eye. So if you have a background moving or something like that, and you're doing something in front of that, like a, you're rotoing out, you're masking out something in front of that, it suddenly becomes matching what you replace that with to this moving background. And a lot of times what ends up happening is it's just frame by frame keyframing animation honestly that happens a lot just frame by frame diving in and just a lot of the times the way i think about it is um it's like you always have this idea when you get a shot you're like okay i think i know probably the way to do it there's these other ways maybe i can pull like a great key or something get a, a nice quick mat but it's almost always like the most sure and true method is the most uh like the hard the most tedious convenient yeah yeah sure. <laughs> just the old true uh frame by frame going through it it'll always get you to the end it just might take 10 times longer than everything else yeah <laughs> um so uh it seems like from what i've heard it seems like you've really been having some some growth recently uh, in your business and uh, people have been finding you and you've been getting jobs. So what's, what's kind of like next and what are some other areas you want to uh, expand into or get into or what's, what's coming down the pipeline for you? In yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not even sure myself really. Um, and it's been, this has been an interesting year because it's, it's kind of hard to, plan those types of things out um i would say i had some interesting job opportunities before the whole covid thing hit and not necessarily that those are things that i want to circle back to for sure but um just getting in with some of the like since i am in the bay area with some of the, you know, there's a whole lot of tech companies and game companies over here that I would I really enjoy, you know, being a part of the team just for even a small contract thing. Um, just kind of expanding that local network a little bit um, because I think I have, hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just kind of riding the wave, I guess, a little bit. So uh, people, people that are listening to this or watching on YouTube um, could be VFX artists or people in the film world or, you know, marketing, someone that might need your service. But also, uh, I predict that it'll be some people who want to get into VFX, but, uh, but don't necessarily know where to start. So um, how do you think... Uh, like, what are some, do you think people should, we touched on this a little bit, do you think people should go to school? Do you think they should just move out to LA? Um, do you think mm. they should, 
do what you're saying and connect with people on LinkedIn? Like, how do you really, what's some advice for people? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's going to be a little different for everyone, but you, you d- did touch on, you know, some people, they really just want to get out there, hit the floor. Maybe moving to LA is a good option for them. For people like me who really like to understand like theory behind things and like even just like the history of the evolution of the techniques and stuff like that, school might be a good option. Some people might uh, really want to avoid the art school debt because art school is notoriously expensive. That's not, not something that I'm going to shoot down because it could be a very good idea, in fact, but I. I do encourage people to go to school if they want to. Um, I've talked with friends in my master's program who just wanted to teach visual effects. Um, So that's completely um, respectable. If they want to teach, you maybe not need, but a MFA degree is, I, I think, at least required on the university level for some universities to teach at. I'm not sure. Um, So yeah, you're going to want to carve in a path of what you, you're not going to know exactly what you want to do, I think, unless, until you're, you're doing it basically. So you're going to want to figure out which directions are leading to the highest chance of success in those fields, basically. So it might be different for everyone. Um, I think uh, relocation is a is a pretty good uh, stumbling here a little bit. Well, so one one thing about school is that you've never had a potential client um, be like, "Oh, I need to look at your resume, right?" And like get your right, yeah. So yeah, school is not going to it's not going to get you jobs necessarily like you can get you can make great connections you can get all the i mean you can get what you put into it all the education you want all the you know hopefully your school has professional like people in the business not just people who have been teaching in the classroom for 20 years right but um so those are good connections that your classmates are good connections um guest speakers, guest events. We had some great ones at my school. Those were really fun. Um, But at the end of the day, that's not necessarily gonna get you a job. Um, If you do an internship through the school, that might get you a job, but um, not necessarily. So it's really more about getting yourself to that point where you feel comfortable getting the work i think and once you're to that point where you have the confidence and the experience and really the show reel is what's going to get you work so you you need to be spending time doing whatever will get you the best show reel as fast as possible basically i think are there jobs in like specifically compositing doing what you do like um for like a big film studio or like compositors yeah Yeah, so there are compositors at most of the big studios, um, like ILM or Disney or Framestore. They all have compositors on staff. There are compositors in TV. Um, Commercial will be more of a contract freelance uh, basis, most likely. there are medical compositors sometimes if you in like medical videos um ar vr stuff is getting hand in hand with that world also there's a lot of different avenues to go um so you definitely want to have a good handling on the foundations i would say um which is another reason why i like school but everyone has their own preferred route i think sure so um for people that want to learn more about you and what you do um how can they 
follow maybe some of the work you've been on or learn more about you? Yes, yes. Please follow me on Instagram at uh, visual.baker. That's what it is, right? I can't remember now. <laughs> uh, we should, you should check, but I think, it's, I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, and actually, uh, you've been doing some pretty cool stuff with... Yeah, visual.baker. Um, my website, visualbakerfx.com or andrewbakervfx.com. Um, I will be releasing some more exciting things probably in 2021. I'm planning on doing, I don't want to get bite off too much, but I'm planning on doing a uh, series of tutorials. Um, so if you're interested, maybe you, that would be something you could check out. On YouTube? Yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I wanted to um, mention, because you brought up Instagram, the face facial filters. Yeah, those are cool. So I like those. What, are your, what are your metrics up to now? It's like crazy the amount of people using some of your face filters. Yeah, the organic reach on the AR filters right now is insane. I'm not sure if it's because they're still kind of new or what, but um, my most popular one was a uh, fire filter. And it, I don't even know what my metrics are. It's over a million or something. Um, but there's no monetization on the platform yet, at least not like a clear route to it. Um, but definitely if you're into the uh, VFX or AR stuff, check out Spark AR. It's a Facebook, Instagram platform that they made for those specific effects. And it's pretty intuitive if you have any sort of background in effects. And it's pretty easy to hammer out a filter. They're just kind of fun and silly things. And um, I think it's a good way to kind of blanket out of a, your niche a little bit and, and reach other eyeballs. Um, yeah, uh, they're fun. Yeah, well, it seems like with uh, with social media and facial recognition and deep fakes and stuff like there's gonna be, I mean, I don't who who even knows like what the future of what you do is going to look like too because like maybe AI will be handling a lot of that those ta like lighting tasks and everything else too. Yeah, it's kind of going to be interesting where AI goes. Um, there's always going to be need for like human artists in mm -hmm. the field, but the AI could potentially make a pretty big impact. Um, I kind of have like a, I'm mostly excited for it, but I do have like a little bit of fear just like of what it will take over. I think mostly I'm protected, but there's certainly positions that I can see it taking over in the next five years or so. Um, but it'll be interesting and it, it will create a whole new bunch of opportunities. So that's the thing about visual effects. Um, I think, in particular, is that it's kind of always on this cutting edge in the big studios like Disney and ILM, WADA, are always <laughs> like inventing new technologies to advance things. They're starting to use Unreal Engine mm -hmm. as the drop backdrops now instead of, you know, just doing Keen and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it'll be interesting where everything goes, but there's always gonna be, that's why those foundations are important because you're going to be able to carry those techniques into any direction where it goes. And you're just part of the job is just staying up on the latest trends and stuff like that. Yeah. John Favreau, um, he, uh, did the lion, he filmed the Lion King virtually. I saw that. And then, yeah, uh, the Mandalorian, <laughs> the Mandalorian, is that the one that had the, uh, unreal engine backdrop? Yeah. Yep. They use unreal and, uh, I think Corridor has made a few videos on that as well. Um, now that's a gaming um, graphics engine, right? Yeah, it's a it's a gaming engine. Um, so that's also another really big 
field is gaming. It passed the film industry, I think, within the past year or so. It recently passed the film industry in wow. terms of of money. Yeah, so gaming is big, and it's going to keep getting bigger. So adapting into those uh, real time engines like Unity or Unreal is probably a valuable, extremely valuable skill set if you're just starting out right now. So <laughs> there's some advice. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there anything else you want to plug? Um, is there anything else I want to plug? I don't think so. People maybe can, can uh, maybe I can be a, a returning guest. Yeah, no, well that's, yeah. So Andy's one of my oldest friends and uh so he's definitely going to come back on and i i mean creative truth is just kind of starting back up again so i feel like i need to get my juices flowing a little bit better so if you have any questions for him please drop them uh below um i'd love to have you back on i appreciate your time and uh, thanks for having me yeah man i'm gonna do i'm gonna close out with a little uh plug for the pod so coming up in upcoming episodes of The Creative Truth, we will include other creative career paths like artists, woodworkers, glass blowers, glass blowers, photographers, VFX artists, and more. Actually, we just had our VFX artists, so we might, we might have more VFX artists. I just or- watched that uh, glass blowing show on Netflix. Oh, oh, I haven't seen it yet. What's it called? What is it called? It's called like... I don't know. It's like a pun on blow, I think. <laughs> okay. Blown out or something. I saw Blown away. I saw there's one uh, called We Are the Champions that has a, those hot sauce, um, the hot pepper eating contest they had in like. Oh, yeah. I saw that too, I think. I want to watch that. So, but anyway, if you, uh, if you don't mind, please subscribe to me on YouTube and uh, leave us a good review on your favorite podcast platform. You can send suggestions for the pod for guests or just ideas to wecreatetruth at gmail.com and visit us at creative-truth.com, which I drop right down there. And uh, we'll see you in the next episode. So thanks for listening. All right. Thanks for watching guys. (laughs) 